When I was asked to uh, present this award to Mr. Williams, and he is Mr. Williams to me, I felt truly honored and privileged to step up to the task. Let me say a few things about Mr. Williams and his work and what that work means to us as a community. He has written a long list of books, 21 books, both fiction and nonfiction, to date. He has also written a libretto, I believe, for an opera, some poetry. But to look along the way, there's more to Mr. Williams' work than just the work itself being produced. He has served as a social conscience for us. He has served as a very hard and cold eye of steel to penetrate some of the myths and stereotypes and lies that have been perpetuated about us as a people. He has also forced us to look at ourselves in a way that very few writers have. In my estimation, I compare him to Wright, Baldwin, and several of the other greats. Uh, you, all you need to do is to look at the titles. Night Song, the first real jazz novel. You look at Flashbacks, which is a collection of journalism. If you look through it, there are some predictions and insight in there about all manner of things, from Israel to South Africa. And this was way before it became in vogue. Captain Blackman looking at our military uh, obligation and what we've done to contribute to this country and the fighting for democracy and whether or not we got our fair share. Mother Seal and the Foxes, which is humorous. It looks at us and how we relate to each other as black men and black women. You look at The Man Who Cried I Am, which is a masterwork. You look at also uh, Clifford's Blues, which is his most recent work. And that underlines his whole effectiveness and mastery at looking at both time and place and going inside characters and going inside that whole thing of history and that blend of what culture and history and politics all mean to us. Oh, it's a great honor tonight to present this award to Mr. John A. Williams. And I present Mr. John A. Williams to you. Okay, on behalf of QBR and a truly grateful black community, I present the Phyllis Whitley Award to the master himself, John A. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank Robert Fleming. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. I'm not sure if, uh, if I would have come in all this traffic and rain and this and that, but actually, I would have. Uh, I've got a few words I'd like to read to you, some things to share with you. And uh, let's see how they go. If I can find the right pair of glasses. I don't know why, why it is that suddenly I find, oops. OK, I got them. Suddenly, I find myself with three or four or five different pair of glasses and wonder when did that happen and why. <clears throat> the 60s, I was asked to do something about the 60s and the man who cried I am. The 60s, writing in the 60s, writing of the 60s, going back nearly half a century. World War II was hardly over before unrest began in Korea and then Vietnam. But we were happy when independence arrived in 17 countries, and we began to hear names like Lumumba, Mboya, Kenyatta, and Nkrumah. At home, black folk were still being lynched right up to 1962. The earlier Montgomery bus boycott had given rise to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Black Muslims became commonplace, and Malcolm X began his own organization. In Mississippi, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman, young civil rights workers, were murdered by lawmen. The year before, Medgar Evers had been killed by a white supremacist there. In 1962, President Kennedy proclaimed, for what it was worth, 
segregation was morally wrong. Two years later, the 1964 riots in New York City began and spread across the nation. Four little girls were bombed to death in a church in Birmingham, and as you know, a couple of the killers were brought to justice only this year. And 30 years ago, when he was a cop and killed a black woman, a man who had become mayor of York, Pennsylvania, also met his justice only this year. There was a 50-mile march on Selma, the march on Washington. On and on it went, riot, rebellion, and slaughter. And then the prince of nonviolent, Martin Luther King, was assassinated in Memphis, his death triggering more riots and violence in at least 100 cities. This was the decade that saw President John F. Kennedy assassinated. Five years later, his brother Robert, running for president, was also killed. The Black Panthers had come on the scene. <clears throat> College students like those at Cornell University armed themselves, and so went to 60s at home. I published eight books in that decade, five of them novels and three of them nonfiction, one with a desperate title, This Is My Country Too. I had had some interesting jobs, book publicity for a small publisher, working statistics for Young and Rubicam ad agency, ad agency, office coordinator of the National Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy, handling a monstrously fine rally in Madison Square Garden. I served as a PR man for the American Committee on Africa, where I met several prominent African leaders, and I was writing for several newspapers and magazines. But I always found time to do my own writing. It kept me sane most times, removed me to a different planet, allowed me to understand what I knew and just how much more I had to know. I'd always been a curious kid who had my head in a book every chance I got, or so my mother complained. I think in some ways books frightened her, this Mississippi woman although she sometimes did read. Much later, she read most of my books, but though she offered little comment, when I was with her, she was quick to let strangers online at the supermarkets and elsewhere know that I was her son and I was a writer. My very favorite pastime was reading. Sure, I played a lot of games, sports, but there was nothing, nothing at all like reading. Checking out as many books as they'd let me at the Syracuse Library and reading late into the night under a blanket with a flashlight. In my classes, I was usually the only pupil allowed to check out as many books as I did because the librarians knew I'd be back for more next week. One of the books my mother brought home from where she worked was Big and Fat and was entitled Eugenics and Sex Harmony. I don't think my folks cracked it once, but I found all the groovy parts and all those fancy names for certain parts of the body and which fit where. <laughs> my mother brought home another book her employer had given her, Richard Wright's Native Son, and that novel affected my perception of every other book I read. I'm quite sure that it was curiosity that made me a writer. And as it happened, my first books to be published were at the start of the most terrible decade, decade in modern race relations in the United States. For me, the 60s began with an oft-rejected novel, one for New York. I'd rewritten it four times, four damn times. The paperback publisher changed the title to The Angry Ones without telling me. I did not complain. I was a desperate 35 years old and angry, yes. But I wanted the damn thing published. There have been several editions since then, all bearing my original title. It happened that Carl Van Vechten, whom I did not know then, was like a great white father to black writers, got in touch with me 
and invited me to a Central Park West apartment to meet Chester Himes. Himes had been publishing since 1945, and while I knew little about him, I looked forward to meeting with a real, real writer. From that time forward, Himes and I corresponded for close to 25 years. Van Vechten had already founded the James Weldon Johnson collection at Yale University, which he oversaw until his death. Chester died in 1984. The very air seemed charged with the onset of the 60s. New black writers were emerging everywhere. Publishers who had been reluctant to publish writers of color in any significant number began to do so, perhaps undoubtedly because there was money to be made after all. Killen's Young Blood had come out in 1954, two years after Ellison's Invisible Man, and it was Langston Hughes with a list of publications that stretched all the way back to 1926, and Lorraine Hansberry with Raisin in the Sun in 59. Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain of 53 would be followed by Giovanni's Room in 1962, uh, in, in 1956, in 1962, another country. I could stand here half the night naming them, but QBR has a listing of 100 books it recommends. Take it off the net. That period was called Renaissance II, or the Black Arts Movement, which had spun off from the Umber Group with Ishmael Reed, Steve Cannon, Eskia Touré, Joe Johnson, and many others. And there had never been so many women writers who kept on coming, just kept on coming. The assassination of President Kennedy and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. during the Vietnam War, produced marches and protests, police riots, and more riots against them. The belief was widespread that the government had informers everywhere, but the freedom riders rode on. Blood was often spilled by the local police, creating a deepening distrust of government and local, local and federal. James Meredith's determined determination to enter the University of Mississippi in 1962 was supported by 12,000 federal troops, and that underlined the racial insanity that, has, that afflicted this nation. I met and interviewed Meredith in Nigeria early in 1964, and later he was my house guest for a few days in New York. I understand his son recently graduated from Ole Miss. But I will never forget Jim's eyes. They held deep and unforgettable unforgivable shadows. In 1966, he published a book about his own experiences at the University of Mississippi, three years in Mississippi. So in 1967, I published The Man Who Cried I Am, trying to pull together all that had happened and would be happening. How much longer could the nation survive rampant racism? In that novel, I tried to show what very well could be, so it was a warning. Did the powers that be think we would accept this, accept this crap forever? When I turned in the manuscript, no one batted an eye at the King Alfred plan or anything else. In fact, the publisher created a five-page promotion piece with that title. Of course, I had copies of the plan, but I trimmed the two-inch purple strip ident identifying it as part of the novel, and I thought I had it with me, but I left it. The two-inch strip on the side said, uh, The Man Who Cried I Am by John A. Williams, uh, published by Little Brown. But it didn't work for me, and I cut that strip off, and I folded up some of these promo pieces and placed them in the seats of buses and subways and sat there watching people pick them up and read them. And by the time most of them finished reading the piece, their expressions had changed completely. For those who don't know, the plan revealed a detailed U.S. government scheme to terminate once and for all the minority threat to the whole of American society, indeed the free world. 
Also, a map of the United States with numbered zones where people rounded up by government would be jailed. Strange things began to happen when the book came out and was reviewed. I once picked up the phone and heard a man talking on it. Who are you? Repair man, said he. <laughs> Fixing the phones from the storm. What storm, I asked. <laughs> then, are you in the basement? He said he was, and I rushed down there and was about to snatch the phone out of his hand and beat him with it. <laughs> but he gave it to me. What's this guy doing on my line, I asked him to the phone. Gee, I don't know. The storm. The voice on the other end said, and on one occasion, while my wife and son were out of, uh, out of town, and I was pre preparing for another trip, I came home and found all the lights in the apartment on. Whoever they were sure wanted me to know. What scanty material I had received through the Freedom of Information Act revealed that even though the CIA and the FBI thought the King Alfred plan was a hoax, they declared that it, quote, would have a serious effect and members of the Negro community. You all failed them. I didn't help myself when three years later I published The King God Didn't Save, in which I revealed that the FBI had bugged Martin Luther King's phones. That gave the FBI and the CIA more to chew on, more reason to suspect that I might know far more than I actually did. So, you know there is terror and then there's terror, and everybody's talking about terror, and we have lived, and to some extent, still live with it. When our Secretary of State, a brother, cannot or will not attend an international conference against racism, that's more bad news. That's more than bad news. That's a disaster. And I think, and perhaps I always have, that a writer has no function as important as telling us about ourselves. You may not remember this, many of you, that we did not drop the A-bomb on Germany. We dropped two of them on Japan. Over the years, people have asked me if the plan was for real. And my answer usually has been, ask yourself that question. Thank you very much. So I was in the barbershop the other day getting a haircut. <laughs>